Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, welcome. My name is Fred Kemp. I'm president and CEO of the Atlantic Council. Uh, and on behalf of everyone at the council, thank you for joining us for this uh, very timely discussion uh, entitled Spiraling U.S.-China Trade Tensions. What are the implications for Latin America and the world? Uh, this event is on the record and being live streamed. To join the conversation, uh, please use the hashtag, uh, Twitter hashtag, AC China, so hashtag AC China. And you now get more characters, too. Uh, before I begin, uh, I want to acknowledge, first and foremost, Jerry Motto of HSBC, uh, Chairman of the Americas. The, uh, the, there was the, um, uh, Jerry has been, the, the biggest compliment I give anyone as a recovering journalist is I steal his ideas. And so I've been turning to Jerry for advice and counsel on a whole number of issues, including uh, uh, the, the politics, the finance, the economies of Latin America. And, uh, and he's an Atlantic Council board director. He's one of the leading lights of our board and chairman of the Americas for HSBC. We partner uh, uh, on this set of activities with HSBC uh, on China's relationship with Latin America. I want to thank you for that. I also want to thank uh, Adrian Arst, uh, uh, philanthropist and businesswoman extraordinaire, executive vice chair of the Atlantic Council's board, and founder of the Adrian Arsh Latin America Center. We quite literally wouldn't be here if it weren't for you, so thank you so much. Um, we're coming on to our fifth anniversary of this extraordinary center, and it is amazing uh, the extent to which Jason Marsak and his team have put us right in front of an area where there was really a policy void in, in, in our view before and to this day. Um, we're fortunate today to be joined as well by uh, uh, former Secretary of Defense William Cohen. Bill, thank you so much for being here. Uh, Ambassador Carlos Pascual, former Ambassador to Mexico to Ukraine, and most importantly, a board director of the Atlantic Council. And thank you so much also for being here, Carlos. Uh, this is a time of uh, great uncertainty. I don't have to tell any of you that in, in the world of global trade. Um, there's just been a high level, one of the highest level delegations of any administration to go to China in recent years. Uh, and they've come back in a situation where one talks a lot about are we in uh, cooperation with China, is it competition, or is it conflict? And if you see the needle right now, it's going from cooperation toward conflict. You'll hear more from greater experts than myself today. Uh, but one of the things we are going to be asking with China and the United States as the top two trade partners for many of the largest economies in Latin America uh, is what implications do these growing trade tensions have for Latin America and elsewhere. And so we'll delve into these con the consequences and potential opportunities further. So at this point, I want to introduce uh, my good friend, uh, uh, Jerry Motto, Chairman of HSBC's Global Marketing, Banking and Markets, uh, Americas, and Atlantic Council Director. Um, I, I think it's appropriate he's given me his new card. Now, I've just said Chairman Americas, right? So one side is English, the other side is in Chinese for the chairman of the Americas, so maybe he can explain that to us. But, uh, but that, that, that's, that's one sign of the times. Uh, he, has more, he has 25 years of experience uh, in investment banking, markets, corporate banking across the Americas, uh, one of the most thoughtful voices on the set of issues we're talking about today, acting as a strategic capital raising advisor to governments, large cap companies across the Americas region. He joined HSBC in 2002 uh, and, uh, and uh, has just had an extraordinary career both before and, and, and after. So with that, Jerry, the stage is yours. So uh, thank you, Fred, for that undeserved and nice introduction. So we're very good trade partners because I also steal ideas from you. So <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, good afternoon and welcome. Um, thank you for coming and being here today. I also want to thank Adrian. Uh, without her, this will not be happening today. But it's a great pleasure to be here today for this important event, which uh, is Latin America and Asia and China, which is one of our two largest backyards at HSBC. Uh, 
This is when it's part of a, a deeper look at China's growing role in Latin America. And as HSBC, we are very proud to be undertaking in partnership with the Atlantic Council. Uh, I'm proud of the work we have been accomplished with the Atlantic Council, and I'm looking forward to a number of joint efforts in the near future. I know there is much more to come. But this event, this event is particularly timely and impressive for the caliber of our speakers and the relevance of its topics. We have entered over a period of uncertainty, and although the United States have shown some positive signs, such as going back to the negotiating table, we cannot be complacent. Our leaders must continue to show alternatives to compromise and seek fair and prudent solutions to the difference. Trade between China and the United States has increased from $120 billion in 2001, this is when actually China joined WTO, to $650 billion in 2016, and I know it's around 710 for 2017. This economic relationship affects businesses and consumers in far corners of the earth. A tit for tat trade war would have uh, far ranging implications and create global economic uncertainty, leading to higher volatility in the financial markets and potentially lower commodity prices. It could also cause an acceleration of protectionist measures internationally. This is evident by the U.S. steel and aluminum tariffs, with other economies like the European Union moving to put safeguards on global steel and aluminum uh, uh, imports. U.S. tariff and China will hit a lot of intermediate goods. Part of that goes into assembled capital and consumer goods, which could make some of the U.S. firms less competitive on the global landscape. On the main concern, though, is that this conflict will spill over into other parts of the world, including Latin America. The, I the IMF latest world economic outlook was generally rosy, with global growth forecasts around 3.9% in 2019. However, the fund noted that the conflict over trade will distract from the reform agenda rather than advancing it. Latin, Latin America would surely be caught in the crossfire between the U.S.-China trade conflict. On the one hand, it appears that some countries like Brazil and Argentina could benefit in some sectors like soy or manufacturing. However, the rising uncertainty around the economic outlook could depress commodity prices and overall output. Trade between China and Latin American countries like Brazil, Argentina, and Chile has taken off since 2005. And I know, as an example, that, for example, uh, Codelco, one of the largest of the largest uh, copper mining in the world, around 2001 used to trade less than 15% with China, and today it's over 70%. Merchandise goods like iron ore, soybeans, crude oil, and copper make up to 70% of the $100 billion in Latin America, Latin America exports into China, thus making them vulnerable to commodities prices fluctuation. The benefits of exporting more goods like soybeans may be undershadowed by the downside of this conflict. As the African proverb goes, when elephant fight is the grass that suffers. With growth fra fragile in parts of the region, major rumbling between great powers could harm the economic momentum. So the biggest fear for the potential trade conflict in the rising uncertainty and political risk, which can cause more damage in the long run than we expect today. I think both sides have begun to go back to the right track by returning to the negotiating table. But there is a long way to go before markets and confident to avoid a major conflict. So uh, now I would like to introduce our next speaker, our former U.S. Secretary of Defense, William Coyne, is current chairman and CEO of the Coyne Group. Secretary Coyne is also a former U.S. congressman and senator. As Secretary of Defense, he was successful in modernizing the military and helping the strength of a number of security relationships. At head of Coyne Group, the Secretary leads a vast team of experienced experts advising corporates, executives, and a wide range of matters. Secretary Coyne, the stage is yours. Thank you very much.
know you have a few remarks to make before we start with the way it's going to work. I have a few questions here that I prepare actually to make this more interactive. But after that, we will have five or seven minutes to actually uh, hear directly from the audience. So be ready. Uh, but Senator, if you want to introduce me. Well, some when a remarks. former senator says he wants to make a few remarks, um, <laughs> I might take up the entire time. I will uh, uh, be very brief, however. Uh, I have been going to China since uh, 1978. So I celebrated my 40th year going to China most recently in the, uh, it's now called the Beijing Hotel. It was called the Peking Hotel when I first went there. And it's an amazing transformation that has taken place. Um, I stand uh, in awe of what the Chinese um, people have been able to do in a period of 40 years. Uh, to see them go from a basically rural um, economy, agricultural economy, um, uh, in, and then to move into the industrial age in a massive way. Uh, and now uh, in a third stage of their development, uh, become one of the uh, biggest, second biggest economy in the world is, is remarkable. But having said that, I think it's pretty clear to all that the, um, uh, the, the field is not as level as it once was. Uh, if it ever was a level, um, but now it's not level. And so while I may challenge the administration on uh, various other policies, I think it's important that the administration challenge the Chinese in terms of their policies that they're pursuing today, and to do so in a thoughtful and strategic fashion. And so the question I have is not whether the administration is right in raising questions about the playing field being lopsided, but rather how to go about it in a responsible fashion to get it back on track so that everybody is, in the Chinese phrase, is, is, is in a win-win situation. So uh, at this point, uh, I don't feel the administration has a strategy for achieving that. I know what the demands are. I don't know that there's a strategy to achieve it. And I think, frankly, uh, the uh, stated objective of doing it within the next couple of years is pretty short term. Uh, I don't think it's possible. So. Uh, in my own uh, judgment, I think what we're seeing now is a, um, an economic Thucydides war playing out, or a trade uh, war playing out in that uh, sense. The Chinese and the United States have been talking about, let's avoid the Thucydides trap, where you have an emerging power uh, challenging an existing power, and the studies that have been done have shown uh, that out of 16 cases they've examined over the years, 12 of those conflict have resulted in conflict. So we need to avoid that, certainly uh, uh, in this uh, age of ours where we have the capacity to blow up the world. Um, but now we're talking about it on a trade issue. So I, I welcome the questions uh, coming from my interrogator. Yeah, I have um, a, a couple of questions here, but I, I think I'm gonna combine because they're all focused on the trade war that we see in today. So the obvious question is, how this trade war will affect the different economies and the different products, and who, what, which economies are going to be affected the most? Well, I, I thought you said it just right. I think it's a, the, the African proverb that said, "When elephants fight, it's only the ground that suffers, the grass that suffers." And I think you, you pointed out the grass uh, may be located in uh, Latin America as well as other parts of the, of the world. Um, it's hard to say at this point which specific industries will be uh, will be hurt, but obviously the Chinese have reacted very quickly to when the president announced we're going to have uh, tariffs imposed on aluminum and steel. Uh, the Chinese said, well, how about some uh, restrictions on uh, soybeans and sorghum? An arrow directed at the heart of President Trump's um, base, uh, the farming community, the, the agricultural community. So they are prepared to respond in kind. They'll do so in a much more targeted fashion. For example, when the president fired the first shot, so to speak, with uh, the tariffs on aluminum and steel, it was designed, at least verbally, to hit the Chinese. It missed the Chinese, but it hit the Europeans, it hit Mexico, it hit South Korea, it hit Japan, uh, but not the Chinese. And so now we have this waiting period of saying who's going to be exempted. So we haven't been exactly strategic in understanding before we take action, we understand the full consequences of it. In, our ca in this particular case, if the Chinese respond, the farming community will obviously get hit. I assume the, uh, we'll see uh, action taken in the, um, uh, the um, computer chip 
uh, industry. Um, Qualcomm has already uh, seen uh, what's happened in terms of uh, its uh, situation with China. So the Chinese will be very specific. They'll look where they can hurt the United States and do minimum damage to them. If they hit the agricultural sector, for example, they'll look to Brazil or Chile or other Latin American countries to come in and fill uh, their needs. So they will, but they will target their uh, reactions to uh, hurt the United States and try to minimize the impact upon themselves. Uh, but we're looking at the electronics industry, looking at uh, um, high-end uh, technology going into China will be hit. Consumers here will pay more for goods. Uh, that means they'll be less likely to spend uh, more money and the benefit of the tax cut will have been eroded uh, by the consumers holding back. I think investors will be reluctant to make uh, investing decisions until they see some uh, level of equanimity uh, settle uh, on the relationship. They'll be hesitant to take make the investments and that will in ultimately uh, hurt the, um, uh, the growth projections uh, of all the countries, including China's. So, as Secretary of Defense, how do you see the relationship with, between trade war and the uh, security conflict? Well, they shouldn't be separated out. Uh, the notion that we have that our military power can be separate, separate from our diplomacy or our trade and economic policy is a mistake. Uh, so I was very vocal about the need for the United States to um, sign on to the TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership. I thought it was a, cl a category one mistake uh, in rejecting that. I understand the politics behind it, uh, that the Democrats felt that they could not support it either. Yeah. But the fact is that that was something that was very important to building uh, a consensus among our trading partners and allies that the United States was going to remain committed to take a leadership role in developing the rules uh, of the game, so to speak, uh, in an area uh, where China would like to develop its own set of rules. So I think it was a gift to the Chinese. In fact, I met with a high-ranking official the day after the election. I had voted early, went to uh, Beijing and had uh, dinner with the official and he just asked me one question, now that President Trump is elected, uh, is TPP dead? And I said, unfortunately, yes. And he reached over and said, good, good. So we gave away something. Now, uh, the, the, the encouraging news is that the President is willing to reconsider whether to join TPP. It may be too late. I think um, Japan and others would welcome the United States to come back in, but they're moving ahead without us. And so that's uh, another signal to countries that we're retrenching. And this is not only in the trade issue, but with, in terms of our presence. Uh, trade is tied to uh, security, obviously, uh, but to diplomacy especially. And they're seeing us pull back and retrench into kind of, uh, you know, make America great again. Uh, we can't make America great again if we're doing it alone again. So we can only be great if we have partners and allies that cooperate and share our, our uh, views. With respect to China, the United States is not in a position to alter Chinese behavior in a way that is favorable to open markets and uh, to the Western philosophy of uh, globalization as such without having partners from Europe Latin America, from um, um, all of the countries that we, uh, that we have relationships with. We cannot do it alone. And so I think that we're kind of breaking those bridges uh, and taking on uh, various um, uh, trade difficulties, I guess I would say, uh, with Mexico, with uh, Canada, uh, with other countries uh, that we're kind of pulling away from. And so I think the United States, if it wants to quite try to shape the policies of the Chinese, we have to do it in a co on a coalition basis. And unfortunately, the administration at this point in time uh, is opposed to multilateral approaches to, um, to problems and wants to do it on a bilateral basis. I don't think we can change Chinese behavior on a bilateral basis. I think we could do it on a multilateral basis in order to persuade the Chinese that you can't have, just as we can't have alternative facts, uh, they can have alternative uh, universes or parallel um, uh, institutions 
where they can pick and choose whether they want to comply with some and not comply with others. So I think that we would be in a better position to help persuade them that is not the, uh, the route for them to go, um, but we can't do it alone. So you've been uh, advising a lot of multinationals, successfully advising a lot of multinationals around the world for more than 15 years. Uh, you think these companies are already prepared to face the trade war? Are they working on it? What stage will you say they are right now? I think most people feel that this is just a temporary situation. I don't. I think uh, China has uh, changed the, uh, the gravitational pull um, uh, in the universe. And I think um, the notion that we're going back to, we'll get through, this is just a tiff. It won't last very long. It will come to our senses. I don't think that's going to be the case. I think we're looking ahead uh, to some difficult uh, uh, years. And so um, I would say that uh, I would tell, I advise clients, um, prepare for the worst, hope for the best, but do not assume that we're going back to a status quo situation where everything is going to be okay again. I think it's going to be a very difficult time for the future, and you're getting a signal that I'm talking too much. <laughs> Five minutes. So, so my last question is, I, I, from a Latin American perspective, I see the Chinese being more aggressive into Latin America than the U.S. Of course, uh, they cannot get strategic aggressive into the US, but they're doing that into Latin America, not all, all, only by financing a lot of infrastructure projects and companies, but also position them more strategic than what the US has been doing the last couple of years. Why you see, how you see the big difference between the US and China getting into the Latin American region? Well, for many years, um, we ignored Latin America. Our vision was always east-west. We had the Soviet Union, and so we were focused on the Soviet Union. When I had the privilege of serving as Secretary of Defense uh, under Bill Clinton, uh, that was the first time uh, he indicated uh, that we need to start focusing on north-south. And so we made every effort. I started making uh, many trips to, uh, to Latin America as Secretary of Defense. Uh, we're back to looking east-west again, and so we have tended to ignore uh, Latin America. When we um, ignore uh, our neighbors to the south, we create a vacuum. Nature abhors a vacuum. Geopolitics abhors a vacuum. So it is only natural that the Chinese and others, Russians as well, but others will move in. It's not only China, it's uh, the EU, it's uh, Africa, it's um, India. Everybody looks to invest in areas where there's an opportunity to, uh, to grow. So I think uh, we ignore uh, Latin America at our peril. I think the Chinese are being very strategic. Uh, they are looking uh, for an opportunity to invest in areas that will provide them with resources, obviously, but give them a much bigger geopolitical footprint that matches their growing economic and I would say military power. So I think we ignore Latin America at our peril. I think we have made statements and taken action which uh, is not uh, positive uh, for us, uh, and I hope that there's a, a recognition that we need our friends, and uh, the friends in our own hemisphere are, uh, are important people. Can we say that the Chinese are playing chess and the U.S. is playing checkers? I think that's a great characterization. <laughs> I, just stole it. I just stole it from him. So why don't we turn it over for questions uh, from the audience? I think that's fair. We have another five minutes. I just extended another three. Well, Secretary Cohen, it's good to see you again. We met the sing, uh, Singapore at the Shangri-La Dialogue. Uh, my name is Celia Lu from Voice of America's Mandarin Service. I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about uh, your expectation for the Chinese pr uh, Vice Premier Liu He's upcoming visit to Washington, D.C. to continue uh, this uh, trade negotiation. Thank you. Well, um, I was in uh, China at the uh, China Development Forum most recently. And I took the opportunity to talk to a number of administration officials before going over. And the message that was given to me is that we're through talking. Uh, we want to see action. And so I took that kind of attitude to, uh, to my Chinese friends. And their attitude was quite different. 
uh, we want to talk, but if you're determined to engage in a trade war, we don't want it, but we're not afraid of it. So their attitude is one of growing confidence uh, in their political system, in terms of the concentration of power, uh, in terms of the economic power, which continues not at 11%, but 75 or whatever percent, still very significant. And they're growing military power, and they feel that the United States, they don't say this directly, but I've had it said before, they look uh, with less admiration upon the United States. They look at our dysfunctionality, uh, that we can't make decisions. Uh, they look at our um, um, partisanship uh, in Congress, again, stalemate stagnation. Uh, they don't feel that our political leaders are um, um, well-versed in history and diplomacy. And uh, they feel that this is uh, kind of their century and they're willing to work with, they need us in order to fulfill their goal of uh, really bringing all their people into the middle class if they can. Um, but they are prepared to, uh, to take us on um, um, economically. I wouldn't say militarily at this point. I don't think they want any kind of a, a military war either. But they're building a blue water navy. They're building a military that will be global in reach. And so I think we're looking at a country that feels that its, its time has come. They have benefited from our transfer of technology or their ability to steal ideas, uh, as has been going on up on the stage here. Um, uh, so I, I think they're, they're, they're very confident. Confidence is, is, is getting to be a little overconfident, but I think that's, that's how they feel. They feel that they're in a position to, uh, to persuade friends and allies to support their way of doing business, uh, as opposed to what they look and see the Western world. It's, it's chaotic, it's, um, it's not uh, producing as they're producing, and they don't have the kind of uh, ability, we don't have the kind of ability to make decisions on such a rapid basis as they do. I think we have time for one more question before I get into trouble. Thank you. Hi, Secretary Cohen, Dan Erickson, uh, also from the great state of Maine. Uh, and I work with Blue Star Strategies. I was in the Dominican Republic last week, and I happened to arrive uh, the day after the DR dropped recognition of Taiwan in favor of China. Uh, and that decision has had some criticism here from members of the Senate and so forth. And I just uh, wanted to know from your perspective, does the US have any national interest in having a group of countries in Latin America and Central America continuing to recognize Taiwan? Or is this really something where every country should make their own decision based on their national interest in, and we don't have a dog in that fight? Thank you. Well, the short answer is I think every nation has to make its own decision. Um, in the United States, I think, if we were to become an advocate for this, uh, we are inching closer and closer to a red line for the Chinese. I mean, I have been going there, as I mentioned, for 40 years. Uh, there is one issue that has never deviated from the dialogue in which um, uh, I engage in, and that is that we have a one China policy uh, and that we have a Taiwan Relations Act. The Chinese have never fully accepted the rationale that we've offered for that, um, but they've accepted it. We uh, don't provide Taiwan with the kind of equipment that would be offensive in nature. Uh, we support a peaceful reconciliation but not any through uh, the use of force. That has been our posture for all of these years. To the extent that we change that and encourage others, as well as ourselves, to start recognizing Taiwan as an independent country from uh, mainland China, I think the Chinese say that that is a red line that we will be crossing with consequences, uh, uh, I think, that we don't want to see. So it's up to each uh, country. Uh, obviously, the Chinese will use their economic leverage to dissuade other countries from recognizing Taiwan. That's what they've been doing, and they will continue to do that. So each country will have to make its own decision, but I don't think we should be advocating it. I think we just stay out of it. So there, I know there are more, much more questions, but uh, I don't have time for that. Before. I'm looking here at the faces like you don't have to. But thank you very much. I, on behalf of the Atlantic Council and the audience, we really want to thank you for the uh, for this conversation was very, very fruitful for all of us. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.
Paul Cohen is the secretary is exiting the room. I want to thank him and, and Jerry Mato for that incredibly fantastic and insightful uh, conversation. And let me also thank Jerry and HSBC for their partnership and support of our China Latin America work over the years. And uh, Adrian, as Fred said, uh, congratulations. Congratulations on the five-year milestone. Today we are uh, launching our year-long effort uh, highlighting the celebration of five years of the Adrian Arsh Latin America Center. I think time really does, does fly. Um, and I think for those of you who are here for your first uh, Adrian Arch Latin America Center event, you'll also see that what's different and how we do things is when we have a lunch event, we don't serve uh, s just sandwiches and salads, but we also serve the food from the region too. So we serve empanadas or uh, other, other things to, to enjoy uh, the, the fruits of the, of the region. I, I want to now uh, welcome up the panelists. Um, I now have the good fortune to moderate this incredibly well-rounded and diverse group of experts to uh, guide us uh, through and also drill down on some of the key issues on U.S.-China uh, trade tensions. Uh, such an important moment uh, to be having this, this event. As they're coming to the stage, you, you have each of their each of the buyers, but I'm going to go ahead and just introduce each briefly. Uh, nobody minds a brief introduction, I don't think. Uh, so let me go ahead and start and do that. Um, to my left is Aaron Ennis. Aaron is the Senior Vice President of the U.S.-China Business Council, a position Aaron you've held for uh, uh, three years now, I believe. Um, she leads the U.S.-China Council's business, uh, uh, government affairs and also advocacy work for member companies and oversees its business advisory services and uh, is frequently in touch with your, your team on the ground in China, Absolutely. Right? Um, next to Aaron is Ambassador Carlos Pasqual. Uh, Carlos is a currently Senior Vice President at IHS Market, where he focuses on global energy issues and international affairs. Uh, also, as Fred said, very important for today's conversation. Uh, Carlos is also a, a Board Director of the uh, Atlantic Council. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with, with the Ambassador's bio. He previously served as the State Department's a special envoy and coordinator for international energy affairs, um, and also served as the U.S. ambassador to Mexico uh, from 2009 to 2011, uh, as well as ambassador to Ukraine, another country that we work on a lot here at the United Council. Carlos, great to great to have you. Thank you. Uh, next to Carlos is uh, Jose Guillermo Reyes. Uh, Jose is the executive director for Brazil and Suriname at the Inter-American Development Bank. I guess in the Q&A you can ask him why he's both the executive director for, <laughs> for uh, Brazil and, and Suriname. Uh, I won't answer that question now. He, he recently uh, started at the IDB after working for 14 years at the World Bank where he occupied a number of different positions. Most recently, Jose, you were a uh, practice manager for global trade and the macroeconomics trade and investment global practice. So great to have you. Next to Jose is Barbara Kochwar. Barbara is a uh, senior private sector specialist in the trade and competitiveness global practice at the World Bank. Uh, in addition to that, Barbara uh, brings a breadth of experience in international trade issues, specifically uh, focused on Latin America and, mm -hmm. and on China, having covered these issues for nearly a decade at, uh, when, at, the, at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Barbara, great to have you on the panel. Mm -hmm. And routing our panel is Chris Marlin. Chris is the founder and president of Leonard International, which is a division of the largest home builder in the United States, Leonard Corporation. Uh, Chris is a, a frequently requested speaker on the topics of foreign investment, investment in, in the U.S. real estate landscape. Um, and also, uh, Chris, I learned before this conversation, you've been to China how many times in the last few years? About 100. We're running right around 100 right now. Oh, wow. 100 times in the yeah, last five years. last five years. So just got so back. You, so you, you live on a plane? A little bit, a little bit. As probably, as probably many, as many people do these days. What we're going to do is we're going to spend the next uh, 40 minutes discussing the current state of U.S.-China tensions, underlying issues, then the effects for Latin America and the world, essentially drilling down on a number of the topics that, uh, that, that Jerry and, and Secretary Cohn uh, uh, spoke about. Um, I've asked each of the panelists to keep their answers short and have warned them that I will jump in if they are speaking for too long. Uh, also, I didn't ask this of the panel, but now encourage it. Feel free to disagree with each other. I think the most interesting conversations <laughs> are when everybody is not in agreement. And, and we're going to leave, we'll leave plenty of time for questions uh, from, every, from everybody in the audience at the end. Um, Aaron, you're sitting next to me, so I'm going to ask you the first <laughs> question. Uh, President Trump has focused a lot of his criticism of China on uh, unfair trade practices. Um, uh, Secretary Cohen was talking beforehand with Jerry on the, uh, uh, the, imp on the le lack of a level playing field. Uh, the President has sent a number of tweets about this as well. 
um, uh, most recently earlier this month, uh, calling out the, the U.S. losing $500 billion a year uh, to China and, and saying that that can't continue. Last weekend, uh, a very high-level delegation, uh, Secretary Ross, Secretary Mnuchin, USTR Lighthizer, uh, among others, uh, uh, returned from a trip to China to try to uh, find common ground on the uh, kind of heated rhetoric between uh, uh, Washington and, and Beijing. An easy question for you, Aaron. Was that trip a success? <laughs> um, probably on the most basic standard, the fact that they actually sat down together in the same room marks that trip as a success. Uh, whether they actually got any outcomes that are of value, I would say all evidence right now is not so much. Um, it's highly unusual in these circumstances for the public to see the negotiating documents that the two sides had. And last Friday, both documents were leaked. And what we can determine from that is that the two sides are still pretty far apart. But despite the fact that they didn't have any specific outcomes in that meeting, I really do genuinely think that the fact that we are now at a point where the two sides are sitting down and at least laying out on paper what they want, hopefully now trying to whittle those down into realistic outcomes that would both address the real concerns that American companies have in China, but also recognize that we have to have measurable outcomes on these things to build trust between the relationship. If we're moving towards that, it was a success. Okay, so, so it, was, it, was, it was not the, the, the full success we could have wanted, but it, nor there was, neither was it a failure. Correct, okay. it, was, it was both. Carlos, we, we, um, on that point, neither success nor failure, um, what is your sense, Carlos, uh, of the international reverberations of the brewing trade tensions? Uh, you know, not just the U.S. And, 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 and China, but as we were talking about previously, uh, what happens between uh, the two elephants is, is felt uh, among in the grass as well. What, what is your sense of the re international reverberations? Are we started already starting to see reverberations of the of those of those trade tensions. I, I think most countries are trying to understand how big it's going to be. Um, Jerry, in uh, your conversation with Secretary Cohen, you raised the, the concept of a trade war. And what countries are trying to understand is, is this going to become a global trade war, which has repercussions internationally and affects the regimes of free global trade internationally, that is going to have an impact on global GDP and is negatively going to affect anybody, everybody. Or is this going to be something between the United States and China where we'll damage one another, we'll perhaps take off a fraction of a percent of GDP growth in each of our countries. It'll affect certain constituencies, as Secretary Cohen was saying, like the agricultural constituencies, but everybody can li live with it. And that difference is phenomenal in depth and impact on what happens in overall economic growth. It also has a direct impact on how others play into it. There may be moments of opportunity, for example, um, in other parts of Latin America, Brazil, largest trade partner um, for China. So does this become a trading opportunity for them? In the short term, that can be an opportunity. If you have a broader global trade war, which is affecting global demand, then it's not so much of an opportunity. So we're really at that crucial point right now of trying to understand how big it's going to be, how far it's going to extend itself. Will it be contained between the United States and China? Or will it become something which has what's much your, bigger what's your reverberations? Sense of that, um, I think it's really hard to judge. And one of the reasons for that is as much as trade issues, you try to keep them within boxes of trade. Um, with this administration, they've tended to extend them into other questions depending on the political events at the time and how that pl they play into that political context. And so you have the, these sets of trade issues. You have the North Korea negotiations, which are about to take place where it's impossible to resolve them and get progress on, uh, on it without China support. And then you have a new set of issues that came up yesterday, um, which we haven't seen play out yet, but relate to Iran. Um, the biggest importer of Iranian crude oil in the world is China. And the two entities that now handle the finance and the imports of Iranian crude oil into China were actually sanctioned long ago under previous sanctions. And so they can actually keep on importing because at they've been sanctioned yeah. already yeah. right and so does that continue and it does it create another point of leverage and tension and so all of these issues are really going to start playing into one another and while they may not be explicitly on the table at the same time when in the end they come back to the Oval Office and you get the impact and the impression of the president 
and what his attitudes are toward China and how he's going to direct his team on how they respond. In the past, what we've seen is that that whole spectrum matters and it doesn't just become one issue. And I, and I, I want to ask that question to Barbara as well. But first, let me just get the, the thoughts from the audience. Uh, just a quick, a quick poll. We're going to do it in a uh, uh, non-technologically savvy way, just raising your hand. Who, who thinks that this is going to become a full-blown global trade war? One person. Okay. <laughs> who, who thinks that this will, that will, have a, will have a trade war, but it will be U.S. Uh, US China contained trade war? Okay, a few more. And who thinks it's just rhetoric and, uh, and everything will be worked out? Probably the most, most hands for, for that last, that last oh. question. Um, Bar Barbara, Barbara uh, what, what, given the audience's perspectives, what, um, but Carl has just described the potential global reverberations. Um, first, do you, do you share the same view as, as, as the audience uh, uh, shares on, on these topics? But also, what do you see as some of the, um, the global effects, on, the effects more specifically on global trade uh, if, if this does become a, a global trade war, but which, which, of, which I think the only one or two people in the audience who, who thinks that might happen. But. <laughs> well, so I feel somewhat comforted by the audience uh, perception that this is not going to be a global trade war, but Secretary Cohen has already told you that you're wrong in that perception um, and that it may be a, a bigger issue. Um, I don't think that this can be contained to, you know, if it does actualize, if, if, if the actions that are being threatened do turn out, it, it would be very difficult to contain it to U.S. and China um, just because these are major powers and they are such important parts of global value chains. So anytime that trade relations between major powers devolve into a game of trade chicken, um, the, region, the, the world trading system has to worry. And there are a couple of reasons for that worry. One is the price effects. If you know, Jose and his team have done tremendous work on looking at global value chains and looking at the impact of this fin hmm? X team, sorry. <laughs> I think they still consider themselves your team, and your name is still on all of these publications. You just like the World Bank, uh, but, a, a, right, a so month ago. So. A month ago, exactly, at the bank. Um, and, and others have done a lot of work looking at the impacts of global value chains and how interlinked everything is, goods and services, and all of the countries in the world. And so the breadth and depth of global value chains indicates that if you increase the price of an input, then the component price is going to go up, and that component is a part of a final good. And so consumers are going to lose, whether it's US consumers, Chinese consumers, and consumers all around the world. That will obviously have an impact on jobs. And as we're looking at, particularly in developing countries, a crisis in future jobs and youth unemployment, this obviously becomes worrying for political stability as well as economic stability. Now, the other reason for worrying is the global trading system, the WTO rules, are set out to mitigate trade tensions. They're set out to mitigate the actions that countries take to protect their economies using trade tools, and so quotas, which have more nefarious impacts than tariffs, are banned, and tariffs are managed. But all of this depends on countries' trust in the system. So if the major players start doing things outside of the system that obviously have an impact on everybody else, then that system is at risk. Very, very good point. I want to, Jose, I want to go back to you on Brazil. Uh, Barbara mentioned it. Carlos mentioned Brazil as well. But first, uh, uh, Chris, um, getting, I think, getting to a, 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 getting to a deal around these to protect uh, tariff threats is is probably, I was critical from a, from a business perspective. Um, Secretary Cohn mentioned in, in his opening conversation some of the uh, effects uh, of, of the effects on the, the, the targeting on, on farming, the uh, computer chips, um, and the real specificity in which uh, China is uh, potentially going to be levying uh, tariffs based on what happens in the discussion with the U.S. If these tariffs are implemented, what would be, Barbara's talking about the consumer effects as well, what are, what are the, the implications for you from a business perspective? Uh, how concerned are you? Um, how does it? How would? How? What, how would this affect your industry, but also maybe other industries that you would you would see as other sectors you would see as standing to lose? Sure. Um, I mean, just the rhetoric alone has already had an effect. 
um, it, you know, I think Secretary Cohn talked about how uh, the brand America is, is maybe not looked upon by the Chinese as as, as functional or as as uh, shiny, perhaps as it once was, and I think that's absolutely right. And in the U.S., you know, the sort of a chaotic business system where everyone's sort of doing their own thing. In China, and we've already seen this uh, as the rhetoric amped up, and I was at the Boa Forum for Asia uh, during the middle of, of all of the initial rhetoric, the first 72 hours or so, you know, the Chinese are, are not uh, as chaotic as we are in the method and manner by which they proceed from a business perspective. So already, you're seeing Chinese businesses that may have been considering doing something in the U.S. not because the policy has changed. And so whereas before they might want to do something in the U.S. and also participate in China's Belt and Road Initiative, um, which is a very important central policy program, uh, now they'll, they'll say, you know, I really just need to focus on the Belt and Road Initiative. Yeah. Whereas before... Which is the Belt and Road Initiative for those who don't <coughs> are familiar? So the Belt and Road Initiative is, is you know, put, put grandly uh, the Chinese government's desire to reinvigorate the original Silk Road at a historical level, but at a very practical level, it is a massive investment in infrastructure by Chinese government, Chinese SOE state-owned entities, and other Chinese concerns from Western China all the way into Central Europe, uh, including tentacles in Africa and the Middle East, um, and frankly, broadly constructed Latin and, and South America. Um, so, so these businesses that before would have hedged and said, look, I still want to do stuff in the Americas, I still want to do stuff in the United States, but I'll also do Belt and Road Initiative projects, are now saying, I'm just going to do Belt and Road Initiative projects. <laughs> And you can already see this manifesting itself in business conversations. Uh, Jose, um, what, what would be the what, what, what does this mean for Brazil? I mean, uh, uh, Brazil, China, uh, U.S. Or sorry, China, Brazil trade. Uh, China became Brazil's largest trading partner uh, about seven years ago, somewhere around there. Uh, we recently put out today an infographic that looks specifically at. Uh, Brazil's exports to China versus Brazil's exports to the United States. You see uh, Brazil exports about five or six billion dollars more to, mm -hmm. to China than, than to the United States. How does, it, is this, how does a potential trade conflict, and if we do have a full-blown trade conflict, what does this mean for a country like Brazil that is really actually dependent upon both the United States and China for so much of its, of its commerce? I mean, the, the impact can be huge, of course, uh, uh, and considering only uh, the trade war uh, confined to U.S. Uh, China, it's enough uh, uh, of an impact in terms of uh, Latin American countries and Brazil in particular. Just to give you some figures, um, one third of Brazilian exports go to these two markets combined. 35% uh, of Brazilian imports come from these two countries. So, so a trade war or a tra uh, escalation of trade tensions between these two countries have uh, potential, uh, potential impacts on, on, on countries like Brazil. And quite frankly, many countries in Latin America have, uh, with uh, of course differences in terms of size, uh, the, the same, uh, uh, a similar uh, pattern. I mean, we have, uh, uh, the U.S. has been the, 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 the usual trade partner uh, uh, for, for Latin America for, for decades, and China is the emerging one, right? So, so yeah, there are potentially very large impacts. I think uh, whether they will be positive or negative, uh, it's anyone's guess. I mean, I, I think. Wait, uh, what's your guess? <laughs> I mean, uh, there there can be opportunities. Uh, mm -hmm. Think of a, a, a bilateral tariff on soybeans uh, from China and U.S. Mm -hmm. and of course Brazil would benefit from them, but can, they can be negative. Think of. Uh, U.S. and China agreeing to reduce the bilateral trade deficits, uh, and uh, China switching their their demand from Brazil to to the U.S. as a way to increase imports from the U.S. So, so at this point, I think it's very difficult. What uh, I think uh, a country like Brazil and many countries in Latin America are doing is to really think seriously about diversification. Oh, and, and this is. diversification is key in mm -hmm. in trade in general, precisely as a as a way to mitigate risks. And uh, the way to do it is to explore new markets. Brazil has been, Brazil and Mercosur has, have been uh, negotiating with the EU for, for years already. And I think there is a strong encouragement to, 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 to really 
uh, come to a conclusion of this negotiation yeah. because this will be a huge trade agreement and, and others could come. Japan, Korea, Canada, etc. Et well, so there are, there are some very interesting initiatives taking place on a policy mm -hmm. level in Latin America and in Brazil in particular. And interesting you brought up the Europe point as well because as you said, you know, the, the European Union and Mercosur have been negotiating for what, about tw two decades, uh, two decades. Uh, <laughs> th this, this, this trade accord, um, but you know, there's another meeting later, mid-month in Paraguay with the EU and Mercosur, and so this, there, it seems like there's been some momentum because of this quest for diversification, as, as you point out. Yeah, there is, and, and, and I think, and, and one point that I wanted to, to add here, and a little bit using my previous hat and, and actually supporting what uh, Barbara said, I, I, I think that one main concern, and this is true in Latin America, those of us who were at the WTO ministerial in Buenos Aires in the last December saw this, is, uh, is the impact on the uh, rules-based trade multilateral system. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what this will mean in terms of this, the functioning of the system which uh, I think uh, we all agree that has been a major improvement in trade wars. So Aaron, I'd like to go back to you on some, uh, helping us to answer some of the, these questions that have, been, that have been thrown out. And I think the other, uh, another big question out there is, is, is there a way, what, what's the, is there a way to de-escalate the situation? Um, what, what is the path forward? I mean, you were mentioning in your opening comments that this was neither success nor failure, at least they've agreed to continue talking. What is, what is the road ahead? How do you, how do you see, um, a, a potential resolution, uh, and also along with that, who has the upper hand? Does China have the upper hand? Does the United States have the upper hand? Does neither 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 country have the upper hand as they look toward a solution? Uh, I think definitely no one has an upper hand at this point. I mean, as we have found uh, with many things with this administration, the key point is to look at what they are actually doing rather than what they are saying. Forget the noise of what might be in tweets or other things. The the administration launched an investigation into China's intellectual property and technology transfer policies. It has not done anything to implement those outcomes yet, but it has proposed tariffs of potentially up to 50 billion, 150 if we're going for the full escalation on it. China has not uh, responded to that other than to say, if the US goes 50 billion, we'll go 50 billion. But they also haven't implemented. That again, to me, is a sign the fact that they are recognizing they want to work through these issues. And I think there are ways to resolve them. It has to be specific. Um, the solution cannot be to think that we can tell China that they have to end all subsidies. I don't think that any of our trading partners would ever agree that mm -hmm. a foreign government could tell us what to do with subsidies. And as long as it's within the WTO rules, then frankly, we don't have any recourse to tell them that they can't do it. Mm -hmm. But there are ways that things need to be structured so that they aren't unfair to the system. I do want to come back to one of the points that uh, Barbara and Jose made, though, on this, and that is I think that the risk here goes well beyond just U.S.-China relations. At the fundamental core of what the United States is proposing for action with China are some things that should cause us all to ask questions about whether we have the rules to govern these things. Mm -hmm. on, on intellectual property rights and technology transfer, the basis of the case that USTR has made is that everything with the exception of the one WTO case they filed on a very specific program is outside of WTO rules. Intellectual property rights and technology transfer, all of China's policies generally not covered. If we are in agreement on that, then at a minimum that suggests that we should be trying to get rules that cover these things. If we, if we all agree that China's policies aren't right. And if they are covered, then we need to be considering what the, what the path forward is. Similarly, on the actions that the administration has taken on aluminum and steel, they seem to be moving towards uh, having partners either have tariffs on their exports to the United States or put a quota on what they're doing. That sounds a lot like a voluntary export restraint, which also mm -hmm. is barred by WTO mm -hmm. rules. These are the kinds of things that we need to keep in mind that even if we think that this could be contained to a U.S.-China dispute and the tariffs going back and forth, it does have implications for the broader system that we really need to be thinking about. That's, that's, a, that's a fantastic point. Um, Barbara, Jose, Aaron mentioned some of your comments. Do you, want, do you have a, a, a response on that? Do you, 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 you agree with Aaron's point? I, I, I think so, and I think it's, it's great that she's called for a new round of WTO talks on new issues, but um, I definitely think that it would translate to the rest of the world, yeah. without a doubt. Carlos, I want to go back to you on energy. 
So um, you, you, you served as the State Department's special envoy uh, for uh, international energy affairs. This is uh, uh, an issue that you know like, uh, uh, like the back of your hand. Is there a way potentially for energy to play a positive role here? Is there, is there some type of, of solution to um, a compromise in which the U.S. sells uh, drastically more oil and gas to, to China to help to reduce the bilateral trade deficit? Um, or especially given China's incredible thirst uh, for energy that we, we, we see uh, play out across the world? Um. I think the role of energy is potentially helpful, but it's not necessarily a guaranteed solution. Um, US LNG in um, China is um, at the marginal point cost uh, of the curve in competitiveness. Um, it's far cheaper to buy um, LNG from Qatar. Um, there will be other supplies available um, that are quite competitive. Um, it's going to cost the United States uh, a U.S. supplier somewhere between $850 and $11 per million BTU to be able to, be, um, to, be able to get to that market. Um, and so um, whereas, let's say, after Fukushima, where the cost of LNG, the LNG prices skyrocketed and were somewhere in the range of $17 or $18 per million BTU, China was crying out for the United States to get to the capacity to be able to export LNG to be eligible to import it. Um, Japan was crying out for it. India was crying out for it. Um, a couple of things have happened. One is that there's just a lot more LNG in the market. The prices have come down, and it's a much more competitive market. And secondly, what used to be very much of a regional market is increasingly inching toward becoming global. And so um, it's, it's helpful, yeah. but uh, frankly, it's not a panacea. Yeah. Well, if, if these tensions continue, Chris, um, what, what other tools do you see the Chinese using to, to push back against the United States? Are, have they deployed their, their full arsenal at this point, or is there a lot that's, that's, that's waiting for? What, what, does that look, what does that look like? What, 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 what other kind of uh, potential yeah. tariff threats and actual tariffs and, and, uh, and implementation could we see? And what would be the effect specifically on, on the business community? Well, that, I think, look, that they have a tremendous amount of dry powder. Um, and I, I won't comment specifically on the tariff scenarios because I think it would manifest itself in other ways, mm -hmm. right? Um, so there are lots of Chinese laws, for instance, that aren't regularly enforced in China. And if the Chinese government decided to enforce those laws, uh, that would have an immediate impact on many kinds of businesses, uh, both in the U.S and in China that are focused on the U.S. Give us an example. Um, expatriation of, of dollars, um, uh, currency controls. Um, th th that's, a, that's a very high level example, um, but one that uh, typically uh, the Chinese government hasn't uh, enforced much of that. Um, and if they put their foot down and decided to enforce it, that would have an immediate impact not only on the U.S., but also in Latin America. Um, and, and that's just one example. Um, I think another uh, example, and, and to bring the focus sharply on Latin America, you know, the, the Chinese have a multi-billion multi dollar hospitality project in the Bahamas, a multi-billion dollar road project in Jamaica, a multi-billion dollar power generation project in Honduras, a multi-billion dollar uh, airport uh, project in uh, Antigua, and then combined with, with Panama. When you go to the Panama City Airport, the biggest advertiser is Maotai. When you go to Buenos Aires, the tallest building in town, sorry, is ICBC. And, and, and the list goes on and on. <laughs> um, and, and, and so that's, that's just been drips and drabs. Yeah. Um, a concerted effort to really encircle um, commercial interests in the Americas hasn't occurred. So those are just two examples of, of what the Chinese might do outside of tariffs. Mm. I was uh, just in Mexico City two weeks ago, and it, 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 when you land in Mexico City, you're going through uh, immigration, like in many other airports across Latin America, you see the tel uh, Huawei mm -hmm. uh, televisions as well, right? right? Yeah. I mean, this is, this is really a concerted effort. Um, I want to move, before moving on to the effects in, in Latin America more specifically, Aaron, it would be great if you could help us to, to drill down um, on one of the U.S. demands, uh, because I think the implications of that go beyond just the United States, they can have global implications. One of those demands is for China to stop subsidizing 
is advanced manufacturing and high-tech industries, which is advanced through uh, what's called the Made in China 2025 plan. If you could explain kind of how that, not only how that plan works, but more, more, more specifically, how do those subsidies work? And why is this such a concern uh, uh, to, the, to the U.S. administration? Sure. So Made in China 2025, China um, likes to plan far in advance. And the policy in general set targets for several sectors that China wants to be a global leader in. In order to achieve those goals, China has directed funds to be put into these industries to help those industries develop. The controversial part of this program is that, not in the official document itself, but in some of the accompanying interpretations that have come out, several Chinese think tanks have put very specific targets for what the global market share is that China wants in those products. Now, the policy doesn't specify that the products have to be made in China by Chinese companies. It's vague on that. That's the assumption mm -hmm. of most of it. Um, and China's government has gone to great pains to explain that regardless of whether it is made in China by a domestic or a foreign company, it would still help to meet those targets. And anyone could be open to these subsidies. What we do know so far is that, in general, the subsidies aren't likely going to be coming from the central government. They'll probably be coming from provincial and local governments who will put funds aside for it. Um, the Chinese banks will probably give enhanced assistance to companies that are participating in these sectors. So the assistance itself will probably be a combination of factors. And in implementation, we may see China making uh, sure that they are highlighting not just domestic Chinese companies, but also foreign companies that are participating in it. Mm -hmm. But again, it's those, it's those global targets yeah. of, of really displacing other companies from around the world and global market share that are at the core of what the U.S. concern is. You know, Jose, go ahead, Carl. Now, if I, I could just say, just reinforcing one of the things Aaron said earlier, is that in, in effect, we need new rules of the game that address some of the changes that have occurred mm -hmm. in the global trade regime. And that was exactly what TPP was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And in effect, the negotiation of rules around mm -hmm. subsidies to state-owned enterprises, uh, protection of um, data and information technology, protection, modern protections of intellectual property, were all part of what TPP was about. And the intent of negotiating it among um, trans-Pacific countries that were not China was to essentially create something so attractive that if China wanted to come in, China would have to play by, let's say, our rules of the game, right, and adopt it rather than starting a negotiation with China that began with moving toward their rules of the game as a starting point. And so now that the United States has sacrificed that, um, perhaps there may be some small microscopic chance that it could be considered again by the administration. Um, but once you've sacrificed that, then you start asking, well, where do you get your leverage? Mm -hmm. right? and, and I think that that is one of the more concerning things is that um, how do you begin to modernize a global trading system in a way that actually picks up on these new rules of the game that in the end can help us create a modern global trading system so that these types of confrontation main, are maintained as country to country situations that eventually work out, but that aren't simply spread around and become a global, a global threat every time they come up. Well, and Carlos, we still do have the TPP. It's just called the TPP 11 now, right? Right. Um, Can I just add one thought on TPP? I mean, I think the, the other disappointing aspect of the loss of TPP was it was actually meeting that goal. We were having conversations with Chinese right. officials who wanted to know as much about TPP as possible so mm -hmm. they could figure out what it would take for China mm -hmm. to comply. Well, I think as Secretary Cohn said in his opening conversation, um, how excited the Chinese were to hear that TPP <laughs> was uh, dead. No longer I haven't dead. had those conversations <laughs> yet. Uh, <laughs> Jose, we, we, talking about subsidies, I want to bring this back to Latin America. Um, and as is, is Aaron is describing what the Made in, in, uh, in, in China 2025 plan means and the subsidies for that, one of the challenges that Brazil and a number of other countries across the region have faced is how do you uh, increase the value of your exports to China, right? How do you start to go from uh, more you know, lo lower value added, maybe commodity-based exports to higher value add added? What, what, how can, are you concerned about Chinese subsidies and also what, what what are the implications of those subsidies for, for, for Brazil, for Brazilian businesses, for example, that are trying to effectively compete with Chinese firms, um, specifically competing in, in Brazil? Does that, does that change the, the playing field? Secretary Cohn was talking about the, 
lack of a level playing field with the U.S. and China, but what about for, for Brazil and China? Yeah, I, I, I agree, Jason. There are issues of uh, uh, level and play, playing field that uh, are still on the table. But, uh, but in general, let me start by saying Brazil is uh, an agricultural powerhouse, uh, mm -hmm. an energy powerhouse, like this country, and also diversified towards manufacturing and uh, technology-intensive uh, 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 goods. So it's uh, well diversified and will continue to supply the world with, uh, with a lot of agricultural goods, with commodities. And, and, and this role, I think, is it's important in itself. Um, when we look at, uh, but, but definitely we, are, we want to, to upgrade in the value chain, no? to say, to, and, and this is what, precisely what China has been doing for, right, right. for decades. But, uh, but not specifically necessarily with China, but uh, in general, no? And, and, and to this, uh, we, we have been also doing our, our homework in terms of uh, uh, investing in, in, in technology and innovation, et cetera. We have Embraer, for, for, for instance, you know, a, a company that uh, trades globally uh, and is competitive globally, and, and others. Um, in Asia, in particular, we have we face lots of uh, difficulties to get to these markets with manufacturing goods. If you look at uh, our export profile for many Asian countries, it's basically commodities. Yeah. So, so this is something that we we, we are dealing uh, more generally with, uh, uh, as uh, a regional uh, dialogue. That's what it is. Uh, Barbara, looking beyond Brazil, um, uh, Chile, Peru, Argentina. These are all countries across the region that export large uh, quantities, uh, specifically of commodities, actually, mm -hmm. to, to China. Uh, how could these trade tensions affect this dynamic? Uh, Jose was saying before, uh, earlier comment, that there could be some uh, mm -hmm. positive implications, but also negative implications for, for Brazil. Um, what about for others, uh, a few of these, uh, Chile, Peru, Argentina, maybe pick one, one or two countries. What, 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 is, what, what is the effect of these trade tensions? Um, is it just price volatility that could be impacted, or is, is there a greater concern? Also, is, does this actually represent an opportunity for, for certain countries? Well, I think when you look at the, the impact of trade tensions on these Latin American countries, um, you know, an obvious gain, at least in the short term, is in commodities, and soy has been mentioned a couple of times, and that's sort of an obvious one. Um, other commodity or, or, or some products on the list, for example, wines is you know on the Chinese list, and the United States is a, a somewhat um, dynamic exporter of wines to China, but others might be eyeing that slot. So if I were an Argentine or an Uruguayan or a Chilean wine producer, this might be seen as an opportunity, at least in the in the short term. Um, but I think Chris mentioned the impact of volatility and of uncertainty on investor perceptions, and I think we have to look at that as well, both in terms of the relationship with China, where you might see an increase in commodities, you might see an increase in price of commodities, um, with you know, Chinese demand being relatively inelastic in the agricultural sector. Um, but I think that especially if you look at Latin American countries are also increasingly outward investors. And so Brazil has massive investments in the United States, for example, as does Mexico. And so you know, this sort of uncertainty isn't great for both inward investment in Latin America and the fortunes of companies that are invested across the world. So on balance, I think that you know, obviously we should be looking for the opportunities and looking to see where if a trade war between China and the United States does happen, how can there be some positive gains um, for commodity producers? Um, but I think that the uncertainty probably overwhelms that. Chris, I want, I want to go back to you, but first, and then we're going to go to audience questions. But first, I want to do another just quick uh, uh, non-technical uh, poll, which is mm -hmm. who, who thinks that the trade tensions could actually be uh, a positive development for Latin America, that countries could actually gain uh, from the, 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 the closure, um, uh, relative closure in the, in the, in the two markets. Does it, see it, is, you know, there's a few, a few hands up there. Okay, one, one hand with a, a shaking of the head, yes or no, not quite sure, but that went up there. And who, who sees the trade tensions as, 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 as really bringing, as, as, a, as a negative implications across, uh, across Latin America? 
much more hands up, and I don't see anybody shaking their head, uh, yes or no. Uh, and, and so, uh, to your point, Barbara, that there, 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 there could be a few opportunities I think people see, but, but a lot more people are concerned about the negative reverberations. Chris, how do you see I mean, Chinese investment? And this is my last question before opening up to everyone here. But Chris, Chinese investment in Latin America, and we've done uh, reports on this. Uh, the Atlanta Council with with HSBC um, have increased dramatically over over the last ten years. How do you see these these trade tensions uh, playing out, or uh, with regard to China's interest in investing um, in the region? Is does the the uncertainty around the U.S. market? Uh, mean that there is greater interest in pursuing other markets such as, as Latin America? Absolutely. Um, I mean, it's not even a close call. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, when you go to China and you know you go to Financial Street in Beijing, uh, where all the banks have been forced to move uh, over the last few years, um, most of the people in the lobbies of these hotels that are proximate to the buildings are from Latin America. Um, and so, uh, it, sure, it, it's, a, it's a validation of the work done by the Atlantic Council and HSBC, but also um, it, it's just something that can ramp up and become more prolific. Uh, but we, you know, it, this, this is, that's an absolutely answer yeah. to your question. <laughs> well, well we, we, did a, we did a conference in Shanghai in uh, September uh, of last year uh, with HSBC, and uh, I was personally uh, um, stunned by the level of kind of insight that the various Chinese investors had about the region, the sophistication uh, about the region. I mean, the China Development Bank has been sending its personnel into Latin America for decades now. Yeah. Um, and, and they've spent a lot of time on the ground there and forging really great personal relationships that don't evaporate. Yeah. Well, and Jason, sorry, just to jump in, I think part of an illustration of the importance is also the fact that the IDB's next annual meeting is going to be held in China, which is not Jose's fault necessarily, but maybe. <laughs> <laughs> We're opening up a can of worms with that one. Yeah. Um, uh, questions from the audience. The, the uh, Yes, sir, if you can state your name and affiliation. You're, you're, so, several of you have wait for the microphone, please. Several, several of you mentioned agriculture. Could you drill down? Uh, the Chinese, uh, because of the uh, widespread discontent and rejection in various parts of the world of the U.S. agricultural agricultural model. Do the Chinese see that as a, a particular weak link that they're trying to exploit? Could you drill down on that specifically? Agriculture? Thanks. And sir, your, your name and affiliation? I'm a journalist, Mike Stone. Okay, thank you. Uh, you that, Carlos, you raise your hand? Um, no, I, I wasn't necessarily raising my hand, but uh, um, you know, um, the um, uh, one of the things that that is always striking about China and the change in its internal systems is that there's this constant tension between, on the one hand, recognizing that there's a, an internal dynamic for modernization and growth. And there needs to be some liberalization to accommodate that, accommodate incoming flows of trade, and to encourage innovation. And yet, at the same time, it's an authoritarian society. And how do you manage that? And it's, it's an issue that extends itself to how it manages the modernization of agriculture over time to the modernization of that society in and of itself. And I think that one of the issues, that in, in my mind, is over time, as China becomes, um, I should say, not becomes, as China establishes itself as a superpower, what are the characteristics of the superpower and the way that it's going to put its imprint and its stamp on its own internal system and then on its role in the global economy? And we're trying to figure that out. We're yeah. trying to learn it. And I, I'd be curious, my colleagues, if they want to add to that, and it goes a little bit broader than just the issue of agriculture, but I, get, I think it gets to a bigger challenge that faces what does this China superpower mean? I, that's a, I, just real quick, I'll keep it very brief. Yeah. Um, it, it's right on point with what you said, and, and it harkens back to something that Secretary Cohen said as well about mm -hmm. um, Chinese reflection on history. So very brief, a couple weeks ago at the Baal Forum, I was very fortunate and honored to be part of a group of about 40 business people who had a closed door session with President Xi. And in that closed door session, he spoke extensively about this tension that you just identified. 
and an appreciation for Chinese history with respect to this tension and the mistakes made historically in China by being closed in this regard, making it very clear that it's his desire not to repeat what he referred to as embarrassments that resulted in the impoverishment of his people for um, you know, hundreds of, if not thousands yeah, of years. Right. Um, and so there is a tremendous amount of reflection, I think, going on in China on that very point. How did people walk away from that meeting? Um, you know, it was incredible. Uh, there were 26 Chinese business people there and 14 of us who were not from China. Um, so Europeans, non-Chinese, and, and I don't think there was anyone from Latin America in the meeting. But having said that, it was, you know, it was a dialogue. It wasn't a conversation. So, um, so, but I think people left the meeting with a great sense, and remember this was happening about four days after a, a Trump tweet storm on, on trade. Um, so the whole world was talking about this was at the beginning of the rhetoric. Um, but I think people walked away with the notion that um, you know, he's dialed in, uh, President Xi. He is absolutely focused on not misstepping. And to the point made earlier, it is absolutely chess on their side. Yeah. Uh, there's another question all the way in the back. You have the last row, but the second question. Hi. Uh, Alberto Hart from the Embassy of Peru. Um, at the recent IMF uh, World Bank spring meetings, the uh, uh, Committee on Financial and Macroeconomic Policy on Latin America, they pinned down that the main risk uh, wasn't on the trade side, but mostly on the financial risk side. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that. The idea being that every time the world gets a hiccup, uh, financial assets in Latin America which are among the higher risk ones, to, uh, there tends to be a flight from risk. Now, we've done quite a bit of work during the last 10 years t to make our assets less uh, prone to risk, but I wonder if you could comment on what kind of headwinds we could f face. Thank you. Great question. Good question. Um, may I? Please. Uh, I think uh, in Latin America, we are feeling already this uh, headwind, uh, as we know quite well. and. Uh, I, I don't think we can pin down that this comes from the trade war or from, I mean, it comes from the changes that are taking place in, in the world, in, in this country and, and in the world more generally. Um, so far, I think uh, what we are feeling is obviously uh, emerging markets suffering as a destination for uh, capital flows. Uh, but uh, I think that, quite frankly, the position that we have today compared to a few years back is, uh, uh, I think it's much more comfortable in the sense that you have, um, by and large, floating exchange rate regimes, you have uh, uh, built uh, international reserve, foreign exchange reserves in many, many uh, Latin American countries, so you are in a much better position to, to, to cope with this, uh, with this habits. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes. My name is Ross Dayton. I'm an independent analyst, and I wanted to ask uh, what consequences do you think China could face for investing in countries such as Venezuela or Nicaragua, and how could that could impact the, this trade war with the United States? Thank you. I can start. Ven and Venezuela is a, a issue that we are very heavily focused on here at the Atlantic Council. Do you want to speak to it? No, please. <laughs> <laughs> We'd all be curious on your views. Um, look, uh, obviously China has been one of the largest investors in the Venezuelan oil sector and um, what we've seen is a systematic collapse not only of the country but the oil sector as well. Um, a country that, what, uh, 18 months ago was producing about 2 million barrels of oil a day already significantly down from what it had been in the future. Um, today it's producing maybe 1.4, 1.5 million barrels of oil a day and many analysts think that that could go down as low as even a million barrels a day by, by the end of this year. Um, and um, in and of itself has reflected the lack of confidence that the international community has had in both investing in Venezuela um, and the ability for them to sustain it. Um, China and Russia have been two of the countries that have been significant investors. Um, the, the investment arrangements that they've generally had is to get commodity in return. And so one of the things that's actually doing right now for Venezuela is that to the extent it complies with those investment agreements, 
it's actually shipping crude oil in return to China to, re to repay its debt, and Venezuela is not getting cash. And so the irony is that in the near term, um, actually complying with those agreements that they've had with China has been actually a stress on Venezuela when it's actually um, as cash savvy or cash distressed as it is. Rosneft has been able to reach uh, an agreement with Venezuela um, where on one particular project, they're going to be marketing their product directly and taking the revenue in directly. Um, Venezuela essentially is accepting those terms because it has no other alternatives for investment. Um, so one of the things it points out is that when you enter into these types of trade relationships where um, and investment relationships when there is an investment in a commodity and the commodity then becomes the actual payment mechanism, um, certainly it um, it eliminates a certain degree of risk in the value and the fluctuation of the price of the commodity, but it can also put you in a situation where it leaves you cash starved into the future, and that's one of the things that I think many countries are actually looking at more generally, not just in Latin America, but uh, around the world. Uh, is it smart to enter into that kind of a relationship, or do we want to keep things on a cash basis that become more transparent over time? And on the Venezuela question as well, there's also uh, um, uncertainty as to whether Venezuela is actually paying the Chinese back uh, all the oil that right. it says it's paying them back and whether blo both sides might be t turning a, a blind eye to that. Mm -hmm. You also now have the added, added risk of um, uh, 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 tankers now being uh, uh, um, uh, confiscated in international waters because of the ConocoPhillips de decision uh, just right. this past week. It, we're, we're almost out of town. I want, I want to give a, a chance to uh, uh, we're uh, out of time on the, on the question. I'm going to ask my last question to the panel and ask each for a 30-second response, which is, where do, what happens next? Where do, where do, we, where do we go from here on U.S.-China uh, uh, tensions? I'll start with you, Aaron, and go, go down the road. road. Sure. Um, 30 seconds here. I don't think the tension is going to decrease. Um, I don't think we have given China any good options of what they can do to address our concerns. And so I think the first round of tariffs are probably going to move forward. So I think it's probably the next step. Um, I, I think taking populism out of the equation, um, hard as it is, is going to be critical. Because the more that populist and um, emotional rhetoric gets put into these issues, the di more difficult it is to resolve them. Keeping the commercial issues to a commercial lane, trying to stick to the rule of law and reinforce it and not, uh, not appealing to, to, to political and popular sentiment is going to be key. Otherwise, it's just going to become even more Thank difficult you. Thank to you, resolve. Uh, as uh, Secretary Cohen said uh, previously, uh, I think uh, we have to prepare for some difficult uh, times, uh, hoping for the better. Uh, I think it's going to, before it gets better, it's going to get worse. Okay. Barbara. And I think Latin American countries have to be opportunistic in seeking um, opportunities from this and maintain and bolster the buffers to policy uncertainty. Chris, I always like to end discussions on a positive note. Barbara, <laughs> uh, so you got to finish it. I was going to say, I think I agree with everybody. It's not going to look good for a while. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, well, you're not helping my calls there, but, no. <laughs> but, uh, but I, I do want to, uh, again, thank Aaron, uh, Ambassador Carlos Pasquale, Jose, Barbara, and Chris for this incredibly insightful panel discussion. I want to also thank Jerry Matzo again and HSBC, and Martin Masiak for their, their partnership uh, on all things China, Latin America, and sec thanks Secretary Cohen. Fred Kemp for opening this. Thank Adrian Arst for all of her uh, vision uh, and and, uh, and, uh, and 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 making us actually all be here today. And congratulate her on the five-year anniversary of the center. And also thank uh, my colleague Sean Sean Miner on, on my team, who's our associate director and, and China Latin America fellow, who uh, put today's excellent event together. So thank you all very much. <laughs>